today we're going to be looking at Shattered Glass from 2003. Probably more than any other film that we've reviewed, we should flag up straight away. There's going to be a massive, massive spoiler in just explaining the premise of the film. So, stop listening, watch the film, and come back when you're done. Although, to be fair, every single DVD box cover and Netflix introductory paragraph yeah, that's is, true, that's is true. basically it's the story of this this thing happens and that's the story yeah. this is another one of those there's this and state of grace are two dvds that whenever i've had them i've taken a marker pen to the cover just to kind of remove that spoiler for people that don't know what's coming because it's such a pleasure to just be hit by it about mm. halfway through so the story if you're still listening is the story of stephen glass who was a journalist at washington's the new republic and he basically falsified 27 out of 41 articles that he wrote for the magazine. Uh, and the story is kind of about his editor, Chuck Lane, who slowly realizes that something is seriously amiss with his star writer. I mean, you kind of have to give it to both of them. It's kind of a, a nice two-hander, isn't it? It's one character comes from the back to the foreground and the other one kind of retreats. It's, it's really nicely judged and balanced film, I think. Yeah, absolutely. This was your recommendation, so I, I thought that this was fairly new to you, so... No, no, I saw this when it came out. I think it was just because I'm a fan of films like The Insider and All the President's Men that, you know, every now and then I like to sit in, in a newsroom and imagine myself in the hustle and bustle. I think they're, they're quite kind of alien worlds almost so yeah i just saw it out of devotion to the genre and was blown away by it. i think it's a really solid piece of filmmaking and and a really compelling story and although it feels kind of contained there's parts of it that i just think are like mind-blowing that it has the kind of audacity for its its climactic sequence is a man taking magazines off a magazine rack and then putting them back on the magazine rack and you know it has moments like that where it just shrinks down to these intense emotional realizations but like beautifully presented in montage uh yeah i just i just think it's like one of those movies you talk about a film that isn't appreciated and also has like a great central performance from an actor that has like zero reputation it's so unfair yeah and to, to be honest i'd never ever heard of this movie at all and when you flagged it up it's like hayden christensen and i like <laughs> much of the rest of the world yeah, was sure. was not impressed with with his performance when he was miscast as the young darth vader but yeah this is absolutely breathtaking performance and, and it's it absolutely plays to his his odd can't quite put your finger on strengths doesn't it yeah sure yeah and and when you kind of flagged this one up i kind of looked to see who made it and like the thing that kind of sealed the deal for me was it was written and directed by billy ray oh yeah okay you're a fan no but i had just watched the comey rule oh yeah okay i've got it on my list it's, it's coming up soon which i thought was absolutely exemplary bit of writing and directing of just yeah, yeah. St straightforward presentation of story and facts like there's so many headlines this kind of links them all up puts them all perfectly into perspective and tells the story cleanly and efficiently and with the you know like the maximum impact i think billy ray he was um he studied journalism for a year or two and i think he brings that kind of serious commitment to facts and being able to distill information to make it digestible for an audience and i think he, he nails that in this and i'm sure Comey rule, like you say, is the is the same. Well, I was looking at his IMDb as a as a writer, and he is absolutely. It's a roller coaster, isn't it? Yeah. Well, he's he's. It, I was just going to say, it's it just kind of just feeding off what you just said. I think his his skills as somebody who who organizes and and tidies up and presents things cleanly and competently is there in the fact that he gets hired for so many different jobs. You've got Color of Night, which is one of the famously bad films of all time. It's that erotic thriller with. Uh, Jane Marsh and, and um, Bruce Willis. Bruce Willis. <laughs> it's funny you could remember her <laughs> name, but not his. Um, vo Volcano, Flight Plan, State of Play, American Adaptation, The Hunger Games, Captain Phillips, Gemini Man, Terminator, Dark Fate, and Richard Jewell. So it's pretty varied. But I'd imagine, you know, like the common element in this is that he's very, very good at organizing and, and doing the structural work. Should we talk about anyone else who's involved in it? I mean, I mentioned briefly at the beginning the sort of the skill of montage employed in a couple of places in the film, but especially that kind of the final 10 minutes. Mm. I was just applauding and I was like, wow, whoever <laughs> this editor is, I'm sure he's pretty good. Yeah. And then looked him up and it's um, Jeffrey Ford who cut One Hour Photo and David Ayer's Street Kings with Keanu Reeves and Public Enemies for Michael Mann. 
so you know kind of solid hollywood stuff and then ends up doing three captain americas three <laughs> avenger films iron man three and you know that's all he's been doing for the last 15 years which are all kind of really big, oh no no s- solid sprawl what is it and the comey rule since the avengers he's done comey rule he also did the um exemplary thriller from the end of last year let him go oh i didn't see that that's really good oh okay cool he's a master yeah he's a fantastic editor and the joy of this one is that the first time i watched it i mean it's it's a pretty should we say unstylish film there's nothing everything about it is quite unobtrusive there's no flashy art direction yeah, yeah. There's no flashy photography and the editing seems pretty straightforward. But then you watch it a second and third time. You say, ah, oh, yeah, that's really, really nicely constructed. Really, yeah, These yeah. things aren't just happening and not happening by accident. Yeah. It's it's really well put together. Yeah, I love the craft in this. And, and like I say, to basically pitch a really kind of downbeat, you know, low budget, super simple climax for the film. And to make it really kind of heart stopping and really tense, yeah, I think that's that's a, a real craft. I was going to mention if and when we come to the climax later on, but since we're talking about it now, um, I did feel the third time round I could feel sort of a little bit of script gears grinding in having all of those things happen within the same evening. You know, I can imagine that possibly in real life they would have been spread over several days, but for the sake of dramatic focus, you have them all happen one after the other within that confrontation but it was still very very exciting to watch in that form yeah 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 i love it man i think yeah you know you have to kind of compress time you know because the film is so short as well it's like 93 minutes in and out you know you get you get the whole story you have like a massive emotional reaction hearts in your mouth at points and then it's done you know you you kind of still got time for a you know a little 20 minute show before bed director of photography is mandy walker who is i guess australia's number one dop she lit Lantana, which I remember from oh god, yeah, 20 years ago. Australia, Hidden Figures, more recently, The Mountain Between Us, Mulan. As I say, there's there's nothing visually, there isn't anything well even appealing about this film. I guess just to tell the story, it's, it's kind of flat and neutral. It's quite flat lighting. In terms of art direction, you just got the basic surroundings. And I'm, I, this is not a criticism. I, I think anything else would have been a bit distracting. Yeah, that's it. I mean, the, the cinematography, it just serves to kind of reinforce the authenticity of the story. That's its, its job here is just to make you believe what you're watching because it's so incredible. Absolutely. Yeah. Music by Michael Danner. Michael spelt with a Y. Canadian composer, I'm guessing. Um, he's been scoring movies since 1987 and started out he's kind of like a howard shaw he's in that howard shaw started out with cronenberg um and dana started out with atom egoyan oh yeah okay did all of his early movies and then kind of stepped up with the ice storm uh and then he's just been working constantly every every genre every kind of movie got an oscar for his soundtrack for the life of pi i'm i'm not a huge fan I, I would never judge his work just by this movie, but in, in this case, it feels kind of a little bit mild and televisual. I initially used to put him in the same sort of bracket as Mark Isham. <laughs> sort of, who you recently slated. Who I recently slated vehemently, but I think that's unfair. It's not great music for this, but it does the job. There were some nice subtle moments where um, there were some piano sections that, that felt quite mild, but then there's like a slight bit of discord going on subtly in the background. Yeah, that's it. There's really a nice. few dissonant notes, isn't there, yeah. underneath it? Just like, something's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was, yeah, it's quite nice. It's on the nose, but yeah, definitely. Yeah. Make, makes you kind of subconscious just go, what's happening here? I'm I'm sure this isn't work that stretched him in any way, and it, it it's kind of competent and adequate. Um, and again, I wouldn't judge him on the basis of this. But as I say, as as with everything else, it kind of it's a team player and it does the job, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Should we talk about the cast? I'd like to start with Kaz Anvar, who played uh, Kambiz Faruha, who was the the editor at the um, Forbes. Forbes Digital Tool. Yeah, because he's one of the key players in the Expanse, so it's nice to see him in a really early role. No delay. Um. <laughs> hey, he's fantastic he's really good in this but he's fantastic in the expanse have you seen the expanse i've started watching the first season and it didn't seem particularly exceptional i felt at times like i was am i watching bad tv here like with within the first four or five episodes so i didn't okay. go back to it bye <laughs> <laughs> so i uh i'm going to flag up a couple of the other things that made me agree to watch this chloe sevigny yeah who is a fantastic actress yeah she's great 
I'm, I'm constantly annoyed with a ongoing well i suppose it's faded away now over the last 25 years <laughs> did you just want it to remain like a cool indie chick that... no i wanted her to not, not to be that because she's a fantastic actress and i found that was really really distracting from the work that she does oh yeah okay and the fact that that every article was more about her it girl status and her lifestyle than her actual work yeah sure because you see her in anything and like in this this is a, a, a small unflashy normal person role and she's brilliant and completely yeah, yeah. believable in it and especially you know she's doing this off the back of i think the film prior to this was the brown bunny yeah, yeah. but it is a brilliant film the brown bunny you know it has this kind of terrible reputation after the, did they screen like a six hour version of it at can or something and mm. it was kind of booed mm. off the uh quasette but um you know the version they released is is really excellent yeah no and i this, really like it and it's the same year she did dogville as well yeah Oh, she's a fantastic actress, so that's that's a ticked box. Uh, and then Melanie Linsky, who I've only discovered in the last 18 months, which is ridiculous. Yeah, I know her from Heavenly Creatures, but I don't know what else she's done. I saw her in Heavenly Creatures, and then she was kind of forgotten. She's the one who's not Kate Winslet. <laughs> yeah. But then she's been working constantly and doing good stuff, um, I discovered. I, I basically watched a, a series by the Duplass brothers called Togetherness. Oh yeah, HBO series. There's two seasons of it. They wrote and directed most of it, um, and Mark Duplass is in the lead role, and she's the female lead in that, and she's fantastic. She's got great comic timing, and she's really likable and down to earth and normal looking. Uh, and then you look at everything else that she's done, and she's been working solidly since Heavenly Creatures. But then recently, she's been getting like a lot of really good work. She was she had a great supporting role in Mrs. America with Kate Blanchett. Um, and she had a lead role in a slightly try-hard indie movie called I Don't Feel at Home in This World Anymore. Oh, uh, yeah, that's on Netflix, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, she's really great. I'll watch her in anything at all. Mm. It's a nice cameo from uh, director Ted Kotcheff. I know, I, I didn't know <laughs> who he was weird, until I looked it? him up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's good, though, right? Yeah, the Director of Wake and Fright, First Blood and Weekend at Bernie's is also a cameo, cameo actor. And it's hard as well because he doesn't do that many cameos. He's only given like four little walk-on roles in, in things. Mm. He's not He's not like a Sidney Pollack or something. Yeah, sure. Peter Sarsgaard? Yeah, oh my God, he's so good in this. He's so good. I don't really know him. I don't know, he's just never on my radar for anything. Oh, I feel like I've seen him in a lot of things. I, I mostly remember him from Jarhead because it, he just has that kind of chilling performance as the, um, the Marine that's desperate to kind of get his kill on and his... <laughs> He's thwarted at every turn by, you know, just the lack of engagement with the enemy and how frustrated that leaves him heading back to America, having not, not got a kill on. And that performance has always kind of chilled me to the bone. I did see him recently in The Looming Tower. Oh, I haven't seen that. It's really good. It's Again, it's another one that, that puts a lot of random information that you know that you picked up and puts, puts it in perspective and lines it all up. Um, he's got a great performance in that. My main note here is that he... he he plays the character, he plays Chuck Lane as, as very, very kind of careful and pragmatic and withdrawn, but that that can make him seem slightly un, untrustworthy and cold. Yeah, well, I think that it's a clever move on the part of the film to, it almost sets him up as the villain to start with, and what he does have is his kind of integrity, and yeah, like you say, you know, he's not a flamboyant character, but at the end we understand quite clearly what where his integrity is, you know, mm. where he's kind of Yes, I'd seen him previously in The Looming Tower and it kind of, he plays somebody who is withdrawn and pragmatic, but definitely untrustworthy. So that, that kind of coloured my, my view of him in this. But it's really good because that's that's part of the character's struggle, isn't it? Because you've got Glass, who's always vulnerable and appealing and makes connections with people. And Chuck, who kind of struggles a little bit with that and, and has to has to face that throughout the film. And then, yeah, you've got the, the star role. You've got Hayden Christensen. And I never thought I'd say this, giving us <laughs> yeah. just a stunning performance. I know, it's so good, isn't it? And I looked through his IMDb. I mean, he's been working solidly since the Star Wars films, but I haven't seen him in anything outside of those films. Yeah. And, th and this. And when I see this, I think it's a shame 
that Star Wars has just done that to his career because, you know, he's clearly talented, isn't he? It's not going to get any better for him because I watched this last summer when you first suggested it um, and made first notes. And then in the interim between then and now, it's been announced that he's going to reprise that role as Darth Vader in one of the 15 Star Wars TV series that Disney are coming up with. I guess you have to, don't you? What else are you going to do? Yeah, I mean, he's our age, right? He's probably just starting to think about his pension now. Still... Let, let us not mention that role again. Apart from to say that a lot of the things about him, a lot of his mannerisms that made him so wrong for that role are just perfect for this one. He's got this kind of... Okay, f first of all, I'm going to say it. He's, he, he's not cool. Like, I know that he's, you know, he's considered good-looking, but he's not cool good-looking. He's not stylish. He doesn't seem... He doesn't have any presence, should we say. There's no arrogance or swagger to it. Is, you yeah. know, he's, he's not ugly, but he's kind of kind of plain thin person he's got this kind of fragile voice that's that's always catching and it seems like he's about to cry even when he's talking normally yeah and the but way that's that... the character right i don't i don't know if that's what he's like in real life no but that's you know he did he did a lot of that for for anakin skywalker as well i think that's just his mannerisms that's the way that he speaks and he it kind of radiates kind of vulnerability you know and i i, I can't imagine him because he's always kind of like this vulnerable slightly upset man child i can't imagine him being being an older man i can't imagine him being 40 or 50 mm. if he's going to continue these mannerisms throughout his life but it's perfect for the role because it's it's somebody who's slippery and you can't quite put your finger on and yeah yeah that sort of creepy kindness that you don't quite trust yeah weird sort of unctuousness so uh we're going to go through the film hopefully not too boringly chronologically but um Okay, so starting at the front, the, the movie has a very clever flashback stroke fantasy structure that comes together beautifully at the end. So we're given sort of several different starting points. We first see Stephen when he's researching what turns out to be his Monica Sells story, uh, looking at conservatives peddling Monica Lewinsky merchandise. And he has uh, what's actually one of the key lines in the film. There's so many show-offs in journalism, so many braggarts and jerks. They're always selling, always working the room always trying to make themselves look hotter than they actually are. The good news is, reporters like that make it easy to distinguish yourself. If you're even a little bit humble, a little self-effacing or solicitous, you stand out. So you bring a co-worker lunch if he's buried under a deadline. You remember birthdays. It's true, journalism is hard work. Everybody's under pressure. Everybody's grinding to get the issue out. Nobody's getting any sleep, but you are allowed to smile every once in a while. <laughs> I mean, even Woodward and Bernstein went out for a burger now and then, and they won a Pulitzer. We later see him do that often and, and in, insinuating himself into the lives of people around him. And initially that comes off as, as a fine sentiment. I've got a quote from the real Chuck Lane where he says, um, We were busy, friendly folks. We were no match for such a willful deceiver. We thought Glass was interested in our personal lives and our struggles with work, and we thought it was because he cared. Actually, it was all about sizing us up and searching for vulnerabilities. Then we cut to Highland Park High School, uh, where we return to repeatedly throughout the film. Uh, Stephen Glass is giving a presentation with his adoring um, ex-high school teacher to a class of rap students, including a hot girl who he frequently makes eye contact with. So we set up that time frame, and then we have some credits, which are quite clever. Uh, yeah, they're nice, aren't they? Subtle. Yeah. He talks about the importance of the New Republic as a magazine and its reputation and its heritage. Um, so the credits are superimposed on scenes of Washington and layered images of articles from the magazine. So you see how the two things, Washington and the magazine, are intertwined. They're intertwined, yeah. And then we move to the office where we see some office politics. There's a really nice kind of three hand to the scene where he's talking to Caitlin and Amy and they're giving him some, trying to give him some notes on his latest article. Um, and you get kind of what, what turns out to be his textbook behavior. He's kind of glad handing and sucking up to people in the office. He always keeps the receptionist, the middle-aged receptionist who has a slight crush on him. She kind of keeps her, keeps keeps her, her on sweet the boil. Yeah. Compliments. Yeah. It's nice. But then the meeting with Caitlin and Amy is fantastic. How is it? It's good. You hate it? No, it's good. It's good. It's just a little rough. No, it's the, it's the worst thing I ever wrote. It's horrible. I... If you guys don't help me with it, I'm not even going to send it in. When's it due? Tomorrow. I may have to kill myself. 
I'm in the New York Times Magazine. Will you guys help me with it, please? Of course. Of course. Thank you. Call for you on three, sweetie. Someone from Policy Review. Why don't you start talking to Policy Review? I'm not. It's probably nothing. Send it to my voicemail, okay? So you want to do this now? Or? Yeah, in a second. I just have to return a quick phone call. I got you some gum. Oh. <laughs> They're trying to give him some notes. They're trying to edit his article with him. And he's distracting and flattering and giving gifts and anything to avoid confrontation about his work. And then basically leaves the room before the meeting's got anywhere, yeah. which is a really nice encapsulation of, of what he does throughout the film. And I think through this, the first half of the film, we keep getting all these hints that Stephen is in demand from other magazines. You know, they're, they're kind of calling up and he's having dinner with people, you know, I think on second or third viewing, we wonder whether he's making half of that up. But, I mean, he did write for Harper's Bazaar, George, Rolling Stone, The New York Times, Mother Jones. You know, he was kind of quite prolific as a writer. I think it's ambiguous. I mean, later on, you discover the source of, you know, some of the phone calls in the movie. I, I think it's possible that these are kind of, you know, he's getting his brother to call up and pretending to be something or other. Yeah, well, I, I will jump in about the um the Vanity Fair article that was a, the kind of big expose, and it said that in the article it said that uh, Stephen Glass created fake letterheads, memos, faxes, and phone numbers. He presented fake handwritten notes, faked type notes from imaginary events written with intentional misspellings, fake diagrams of who sat where at meetings that never transpired fake voicemails from fake sources. He even inserted fake mistakes into his fake stories so that fact checkers would catch them and feel as though they were doing their jobs. <laughs> I mean, that's that's somebody that's really kind of living in the zone, isn't I like, it? I like the inserting mistakes things. That's that's something I've done in the past. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you sure. present something, you, you give them something to chew on, then you'll distract yeah, yeah, from yeah. all the other things you want to get through. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And we have a, a story table meeting, uh, another school flashback, and then we get uh, another kind of flashback, which may or may not be real. It's the CPAC after party, where you see some of the things that the young conservatives are supposedly getting up to in their hotel rooms, which yes, is the, uh, the, the core the of the story. Convention. Yeah, that's it. It's one of the two fabricated stories that the film hangs its structure on. And then you get the first scene with Chuck and Stephen in the break room, which is just, you know, within... Such a great scene. Yeah, sentence. within one minute you get you get their characters and the, the yeah, tension yeah. between them in one go. You've got... Yeah. Chuck is yeah. kind of... <laughs> He's doing a piece on, like, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, isn't he? You know, kind of really sort of literary and intellectual and, you know, worthy... And he's kind of straight-faced and, and non-committal because usually when Stephen's talking to people, he kind of draws them out of themselves and, and and gets them to say, you know, more than they would otherwise. But Chuck is so kind of quietly non-committal that it's... And you can see Stephen trying to get his claws in and kind of like... Yeah, yeah. Not, not quite getting in there, so he kind of gets up and leaves. And Yeah, and Stephen does that thing which we see throughout the film. He has a couple of catchphrases. One is like, are you mad at me? But the, the, the other one is uh, whenever he's pitched at some outlandish story idea that he, you know, he says he can authenticate and back up, but he always says, uh, oh, maybe, it's, maybe it's silly. I'll, I'll just can it. Maybe I'll kill it. I like it at the end of that scene where Chuck just says to him, yeah, sounds great, Steve. You know, really... It's kind of dismissive, isn't he? I don't know if at this point he's clocked that. No, I don't think so. I think that's that's the ambiguity of the character, isn't it? You think you think that he's dismissive or that they don't get on, but he just is quiet and doesn't give much away. Because you know, later on when they do when there's the table read, it's like a pitching session, isn't it? Round table pitching session for articles. He's he's quite relaxed and appreciative of of the story that that Stephen's telling there, and you know he's enjoying. Yeah, but he it a does lot. say. Um, you know, because then they go to Chuck next at, at that meeting and he's like, well, that, that's a really hard act to follow. That's a really, you know, it's almost like it's impossible to follow Stephen and one of his outlandish stories, you know, fully flavoured and coloured in at the edges. You know, there's no kind of detail left unturned, is there? So Michael Kelly at this point is the editor and the CPAC story rears its head. It's really interesting. The first, the first kind of confrontation about one of his stories, it, one of one of Stephen's kind of deflecting tactics is to always show his belly first. You know, he's always saying, are you mad at me? Am I going to get fired? 
and that way you know you kind of show your belly and you're 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 daring the other person to make the aggressive move yeah. and often they'll back down and not do that and this, this is the first time that you kind of see that in action you're going to see it see it quite a lot later on there's the party scene where i guess this is a party it's at stevens isn't it yeah he talks about setting up a party doesn't he and uh they're making jokes about the beer being in alphabetical order um and how kind of perfect it is that this is Stephen's party. And he's being courted, I think, by the editor of George. I, I couldn't quite put my finger on whether he's in a relationship with Caitlin or not. They do seem to be fairly intimate in their conversations here, but then nothing else comes of it later on. No, I think they're just like platonic. They could even be like flatmates or something, or, you know, they seem like really close. She seems more kind of mothering and protective of him than kind of attracted to him like to get a little sidebar in. I know it's inconsequential in the film, but I really, really did like the publisher, Marty, getting them to check all the commas in the latest issue of the magazine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because yeah, yeah. I'm finding excessive commas are giving me more and more trouble as I get older. I've, I'm more sensitive to them in other people's writing, and I find that I use them too much myself, and I have to go back and okay. proofread all my emails to make sure <laughs> there aren't excessive commas there. So the next key event, I guess, is Michael, the editor, being fired and Chuck being given his job which is politically very, very difficult for Chuck. This is the first real sign that you get that Stevens actually consciously manipulative. This is, you know, at this point, he's stoking feelings against Chuck amongst these co-workers. He's saying that there's people in the office that are kind of pro-Mike Kelly, and if you're pro-Mike Kelly, then Chuck's got it in for you. He's going to stab you in the back, you know. He kind of plays that line a couple of times through the film. But he also... After Mike Kelly has left, the next day he goes into Chuck's office and is like, oh, look, if you need a hand with your boxes, I'm just kind of in my office, you know, no hard feelings, mm. you know, it's going to be fine. It's a really nice kind of real-time tracking shot, you know, as, as Chuck is bringing his boxes through to his office as Michael's just left the building. Oh, yeah. Just a just a, a long real time awkward awkward walk through the office, the occasional kind of cutaway to yeah. But it, I mean, it's still really good at just kind of pushing Chuck into the bastard territory when you're watching it. Like, oh, that bloody Chuck! <laughs> and so it's it's really nice when he kind of comes from that low point really to be quite triumphant at the end. When I was watching it the last time, making notes, I, I checked the timings on playback, and that's exactly thirty minutes in, end of Act One. You've established oh, really? all the characters and the setup. Yeah, okay. Well, Very cool. neat and tidy. So, Act 2. Starts with a hacker's convention, doesn't it? Yeah, duped my chronic story. So you start with one of the table pitch meetings. Um, and Stephen is acting out the story. And you get these really nice kind of deft cuts between his fantasy of it, I guess, because it's an imaginary story. Um, and him recounting it and acting it out at the table. Yeah, and you, but you also get it, it. It's so crystal clear in the minds of the people that he's pitching it to. And I think this is kind of what we understand of Stephen, you know, we know now that he was lying, but that doesn't... Doesn't make him any it less doesn't, of a good yeah, storyteller. Yeah, like, he's still a good storyteller, yeah, even if... Yeah, it's a shame. I think he published a novel, didn't he, uh, a few years after his kind of expose, and... It was, yeah, it was called The, the Fabulist. It was basically a retelling of his own story. Yeah, you, you cut to the reactions of everyone around the table in the meeting, and then... He he does his usual kind of showing his belly, undercutting himself. Oh, it's really silly. I'm not even sure if I'm going to finish it. Yeah. Just kind of, it's just like a kind of humble brag type thing, isn't it? Yeah. But I don't know about you, but I remember hearing around this sort of time about this sort of thing happening, about hackers being brought on by software companies and going to work for them. It feels like that was something that was very much kind of in the popular consciousness as we approached Y2K. Mm. Um and I wonder if it all just originates from this fabricated story or or if that's actually, if it ever actually happened. Oh, interesting. We cut to the offices of Forbes in New York and hats off really, really quickly sketching in a whole other office environment with a group of supporting characters within one scene with, with yeah, absolute yeah. crystal clarity and it's really vivid. And Yeah, yeah. But also I, I love that the story, once once they've played their part, they're gone. Like we don't, there's no follow up with them at all. It's like, okay, this is what, you know, their involvement in the story, they were the catalyst for this event, but they weren't there when it all kind of wrapped up neatly. So they're gone. You know, we never see them again. I love that. I like that the guys at Forbes called the New Republic the snottiest rag in the business. <laughs> <laughs> this idea that it's kind of long overdue to be brought down a peg or two. 
There's a nice handful of scenes showing Glass's slightly corrosive influence in the office with, with his increased popularity with his articles. He's kind of a slightly bigger ego in the office and, and David, one of his uh, colleagues, coming to him for advice on his piece and that sort of thing. Oh, he's, yeah, yeah. he's kind of acting as almost like as a sub-editor as well as a writer. And you have the meeting between Amy and Caitlin where Amy's trying to write in a kind of Stephen Glass influence style and it's not doing any good. Yeah, I think, but I think those scenes are really good at just showing how much everybody looks at everybody else's work. You know, that's the kind of the process of getting something from page into print is that lots of people look at it. So that's what makes it even more incredible when you realize that he's been falsifying these stories. I think that the, the point of those scenes is just to kind of reinforce how incredible it is that it got through all the filters. Yeah, we were just talking about Forbes Digital and when they start to um, examine Stephen's hacker piece in greater detail. There's a really nice point where Adam just calls it a sieve. <laughs> and he says, uh, oh, you know, I've, I've been through every detail of it and there's one thing that seems true and that's that there is a state in the Union called Nevada. That's it, that's the only thing that holds water. It's quite a nice sort of uh, misdirection in this second act as well, where most people seem to think that Stephen has been conned by the hackers, you know, that the hackers have pulled the wall over his eyes and fed him a, a load of lies and he's kind of just run with it. And that's that becomes his kind of defence as well. It's a real shame that, that it's impossible to come to this movie absolutely blind. Like, mm. I mean, there's no way you won't even get... You'll be able to watch this without... Obviously, you have to read a short synopsis about something to see what it's about before you decide to yeah, watch yeah. it. But if you were coming to this blind and you knew nothing about it, you could possibly be taken in by that as well. You could think yourself that, mm. oh, has he been misled or something like that? But it does seem, yeah, that, that doesn't, doesn't quite land for me in the second act, the fact that, that people would think he's been misled. And I, and I think that's probably just because I know coming in that he's lying sure. throughout. Mm. Um, uncomfortable is the key word for the rest of the movie now but um very uncomfortable scene where chuck is kind of calls him into the office about the about the hacker piece and immediately you know Stephen is did i do something wrong are you mad at me he's trying to leave as well isn't he? he's like shall i go and wait in my office he's like <laughs> no you stay right here young yeah man. And take he, a seat chuck is kind of slowly methodically checking the facts while Stephen's in the room and uh, on edge i i do find Stephen. For somebody who's such a serial liar is quite a bad liar in person he's he's completely unable to relax he's kind of over attentive and over earnest and giving away too yeah, much yeah. but i think that's why he's always trying to excuse himself from a space isn't it you know he's i think that's why the scene that you flagged up early in the beginning with the two girls are trying to help him with his piece i think he just doesn't want to be put on the spot he wants to go home manufacture it in his at his own pace there's another interesting sort of sidebar scene where David uh, comes across Stephen late in the office um, at the point where he's kind of working on his fake website for Duke Microsoft. <laughs> yeah, yeah. um, Brilliant. It's um, so good. Though. But it's it's a really interesting kind of reversal because obviously because he's very uncomfortable, Stephen's, you know, David is doing the attentive thing and he's doing the thing that Stephen kind yeah, of yeah. says that you need to do to, 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 to make yourself known to people. You know, you have to be friendly to them and, and help them out and generous towards them and and david's doing exactly that late in the office and um stephen's just catches him with, you know with his fingers in the till essentially yeah. doesn't he <laughs> but stephen's just absolutely terrible at receiving that with good grace he's really kind of unnerved by it i guess because it's kind of it's it's generosity and consideration but it's not on his terms really nice cross cutting you keep cutting back to the forbes offices to demonstrate the the story kind of coming apart in the background yeah, there's a nice conference call as well, isn't there? Is that the, I think that's the next day when they're going over some of the details and Stephen, you know, he's quick-witted and you know quick with his responses, but he just can't manufacture evidence to support his story. Yeah. And there's one point where uh, Adam just says, uh, you know, this guy is toast, <laughs> he says it to his editor <laughs> when they're on the conference call. It's, there's a really, really nice editorial there's not many flourishes in this, but the film just kind of dips to black after that. You, you don't need to know what happens next, and you just come back out of black for the very end of the meeting. I think just at the end of that meeting, there's a really nice cross-cutting sequence as well, where we have Stephen back in his office in tears, you know, saying to the members of staff that 
Chuck is out to get him. He's trying to stab him in the back, and it's because he's loyal to Kelly, and you know that's it. He's gonna he's gonna kill him and kill his career. And then you cut to Chuck on the phone trying to save Stephen, just phoning the other editors and uh, um, the digital tool, just saying, "Please, like he's just a kid. He's made a terrible mistake. Don't do this to him. It's not fair. Like just let him kind of walk away from this." He's really doing his best to save him. I just think that's that's a lovely moment where we suddenly understand the personalities of those two men it allows us to kind of switch sides essentially from Stephen to chuck we get the drive to bethesda to because chuck wants to see the hotel and the restaurant where these meetings supposedly took place yeah the conference center yeah he just wants to kind of walk through it you know just show it i think he still wants to believe that Stephen hasn't made up everything yeah it's, it's purely you know just just to cover their back because he wants to be absolutely sure when more questions are asked the next day. But this is some f- fabulous characterization of a liar. I-, I remember lying when I was a child, and I remember your inability to step outside it or to embellish on it or to adapt it or to make it more realistic. You just can't yeah. think outside of it. So when Stephen's confronted with the utter nonsense of his lies, he's, all I know is I was here. Yeah, I'm feeling very attacked, he says. I don't like the way you're talking to me, Chuck. I, it's like you won't even talk to me. I didn't do anything wrong. He keeps going back to these childlike phrases. He's, yeah, yeah, exactly. But again, Chuck's performance, I really like this, because he just keeps saying things like, that doesn't seem very credible to me, Stephen. <laughs> you, know, like, you can see his patience now is starting to wear thin. Now that he's starting to see through the uh, the illusion, see through the bullshit. There's um, a couple of nice scenes with the colleagues kind of turn the screws on Chuck after this. First it's Lewis and then Caitlin are both trying to convince him that, you know, give him a break. He's just a kid who's been duped. And... Yeah, yeah. But it just shows how much affection there is for him in the office, you know, and how kind of loved he is and, and how good a job he's done at barricading his position there was a really good um narrative link caitlin emailing somebody who turns out to be michael the previous editor and then you fade through to stephen visiting him and he's done that moody teenager thing where he's kind of sat on the floor all curled <laughs> up in a ball waiting for him to come around the corner and then just kind of lays it on thick about oh, it's because of my loyalty to you and you know to to his credit michael kelly is just like look He's well within his rights. In fact, he should have sacked you. What you did was, you know, it's unethical. And then just, like, says to him, did you, did you do this when you worked for me? Did you cook a story when I was your boss? I think he asks him. We don't see the answer, but... Yeah, it's left quite ambiguous. It's really nice. When Stephen can't get his hooks into somebody, he doesn't have another tactic. He doesn't have another way of approaching someone. He just kind of puts his foot on the gas because at one point he says, now who's going to hire me? As if to say, yeah. you know, will you we're close. Yeah. Will you hire me? Yeah, yeah. He's so unsubtle. And then I guess we are now into the third act because this is where it all comes to pass, isn't it? It's the, f- yeah. it's the it's phone brilliant. call from David, isn't it, to Chuck at home? So, d- yeah, David calls Chuck and is just like, oh, I've just spoke to him. He wants me to drive him to the airport. He's afraid of what he might do to himself. And, you know, and then there's a nice kind of subtle slip that his family are in Chicago, but his brother is in Palo Alto, which is the same place that, duped Micronics apparently have their telephone number registered at and that's when Chuck is able to join the dots and realize that Stephen's brother has been you know leaving voicemails and being the kind of the other the other person in the in the mystery that he couldn't quite crack he just goes straight to the office doesn't he He knows where Stephen's going to be just confronts him and then like frog marches him out of the office um, and then realizes that if he's done it with one story he could have done it with the others and as you say that fabulous subtly dramatic moment where he just kind of starts taking back issues off the shelves yeah, and yeah. going through them all um yeah we have like chuck reading a magazine we have steven's voice and then he just slams it to the floor we get the slap of the magazine another magazine being opened and then we hear steven's voice and then as it builds we start to see flashbacks of the other people at the round table conference pitching laughing at Stephen's anecdotes and you just realize you know how everyone's been duped how massive this is and yeah i just uh i thought it was a, a lovely lovely bit of montage lovely bit of work that so i did say earlier i was a little bit uncertain about you know I, I did feel that this was all stuff that in real terms would happen over a few days it wouldn't necessarily happen within the space of one night but it's nicely kind of theatrically compressed into this 
kind of short selection of scenes. You even get, you know, the final confrontation with Caitlin in the lobby immediately afterwards. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, but I think that's good dramatically because Chuck still hasn't, like, let loose on Stephen, which, you know, you can feel that he probably wants to, but it's also, like, what's the point? You know, this this guy is never going to hear what anything that Chuck has to say. You know, he's so stuck in his own head and, and defending his position. But Caitlin is defending Stephen's position, but is also receptive enough to hear that a deception has taken place and they're all kind of complicit in it to some extent and the danger that that represents to the magazine and all the work that they've done, all the good work and the good reputation of the magazine. What are you going to do, Chuck? Pick us off one by one? Everybody that was loyal to Mike? Do you have a staff that belongs to you? Is that the kind of magazine you want to run? Caitlin, when this thing blows, there isn't going to be a magazine anymore. Now, if you want to make this about Mike, make it about Mike. I don't give a shit. You can resent me, you can hate me, but come Monday morning, we're all going to have to answer for what we let happen here. We're all going to have an apology to make. Jesus Christ, don't you have any idea how much shit we're about to eat? Every competitor we ever took a shot at, they're going to pounce, and they should, because we blew it, Gaitlin. He handed us fiction after fiction, and we printed them all as fact. Just because... We found him entertaining. It's indefensible. After a, a perfect bit of compressed writing, you get this breathtaking final montage where the different elements of the structure all come together effortlessly. The elements are the Monday morning meeting uh, where Chuck arrives to find everyone else, all the staff and the publisher waiting for him. And then you cut back to the high school where Stephen is talking to the students uh, and his adoring ex-teacher says, you know, you could you could do these kids a giant favour, <laughs> write something boring. <laughs> um, Chuck arrives and sees the signed letter of support and apology to readers signed by everyone in the office. It's heavy that, isn't it? Because it's like, it's such a kind of awful thing for them all to have to do, but it's so kind of euphoric that they've also all seen that Chuck was right and they're all on his side and they all support his kind of crusade now. You cut back to the high school. The teacher says, you know, well, what do you think of this guy? When, you you know, the students applauding, you cut to the staff applauding into, your, into the office and it's clearly that line refers to Chuck in his situation as yeah, well. Yeah. It's really nicely intercut. You know, you come to a close-up of Stephen and then you cut to the empty room so you realise that the whole high school thing's been a fantasy and then cut to a wide empty room, back to a close-up of glass and then you jump cut to a close-up of glass in the lawyers' meeting, the final meeting in the film. Yeah. Um, and you realise that the whole thing has been a fantasy playing out in his head. Yeah, wow. And there's that, I think, just that lovely kind of final nail in the coffin where Chuck says uh, they've got the, they're with their lawyers, aren't they? It's like a, a final kind of deposition type thing. I know you can't admit guilt of any kind, but I want you to confirm a few titles for me. We're not prepared to confirm or deny anything at this time. What I'm going to do is this. I'm going to read to you a list of suspicious titles, one by one. If you raise an objection to a particular title, we'll fact check it again in the hope of removing it from the list. If you remain silent, we'll assume that piece is fabricated, either partially or entirely. And for that, we just stay on Stephen's face and we see it kind of play out. It's another one of those kind of classic movie closing close-ups, isn't it? It's just really great. There's a really nice bit of attention to detail in this last meeting. It was just a really good bit of business with the you know tiny little supporting roles, the two guys who play the lawyers, yeah. the guy who's, who's Chuck's lawyer. has got this really kind of slightly smug, slightly you know you fucked look on his face yeah. so just it's very subtle the but when, he, uh, when he's looking over at the the other the other lawyer he's mm. kind of blustery and and grudging and non-committal yeah and then we're out that was a really good recommendation yeah it's a really kind of solid you know underknown movie isn't it yeah like proper... it's hidden gem yeah to this day i would never have heard of it if you hadn't recommended it oh my job here is done yeah, yeah i mean I just i mean it's it's an audacious story isn't it to think that you know, a young journalist would go to those kind of lengths and just become, I don't know, so complacent with the constant lying <laughs> that they would publish dozens and dozens of fake articles and take all the money and just kind of keep lying through their teeth. And at the same time, studying for the, the, the bar, you know, just studying to be a lawyer. I think he passed the bar but couldn't get 
a license because of this scandal. From an article in the New York Times, apparently, uh, when Stephen Glass saw the film and was reflecting on the experience, he just said, uh, it was very painful for me. It was like being on a guided tour of the moments of my life I am most ashamed of. What I like about it and why I'm glad that we've covered it amongst the films that we've talked about is because it's good occasionally to have something that's focused and unflashy and unstylish and you know isn't isn't obsessed with showing off it's just obsessed oh yeah it's just telling the story it's never going to be a cult film you know it's never going to it doesn't have that edge or that danger but what it does have is impeccable technique <laughs>